All right, welcome everyone to our Fix the Grid event um, with Dr. Richard Silkman. I'm Matt Cannon. I'm the Sierra Club's Campaign and Policy Associate Director here in Maine at the Maine chapter. Um, and we're really happy to have you all here for what is our last event before the summer. Um, so we're really excited to have Dr. Richard Silkman here to give us his insights and um, a blueprint for a zero carbon economy. He has an extensive bio, but just quickly, he's a PhD economist and co-managing partner of Competitive Energy Services, former director of the state planning office and a nationally recognized expert in the regulation of public utilities and development of competitive energy markets. Um, there is much more to his biography and I'll, I'll put it in the chat um, and feel free to fill in as many gaps as you think, but we're really happy to have you, Dr. Stolkman and um, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Matt. And thanks for having me a little before Memorial Day. So we have the summer to look forward to. <clears throat> what I wanna talk about today is a book that I put together oh, about a year and a half ago now and which looked to see whether or not Maine on its own could achieve a zero carbon economy. And if so, how it might go about doing that and what it might cost us in terms of what we have to pay for energy and related services. Uh, <clears throat> so if any of you are interested in this, uh, let Matt in the book, let Matt know and at the end, there's a, there's a link to the digital version, but for those of us who like to have something in our hand when we read, I'm happy to send you a hard copy uh, if you'll pass on your, your address to me. So <clears throat> what I set about doing <clears throat> was trying to decide whether or try to figure out how we could get to a zero carbon economy and whether we could do it without jeopardizing the health and vitality of our current economy. I mean, it doesn't do us any good to get to zero carbon if it's gonna cost us so much money <clears throat> as to be unaffordable because then nobody will do it. And so as I said about trying to model energy use in Maine and model this transition, <clears throat> what I realized is that it is possible to do this. I mean, it's gonna take a lot of work it's going to take a lot of transitioning. It's going to take a lot of redefinition of what the economy is. <clears throat> but over the next 30 years, <clears throat> what I've demonstrated in the book is that we can get to a zero carbon economy in Maine. And most importantly, if we are careful, if we do it smart, we can do it spending no more on energy over this 30 year period every year <clears throat> than we spend on energy today. Now, <clears throat> the way to do this is through <clears throat> five processes, and those are highlighted here in yellow. The first, <clears throat> and most of you who have looked at this area are gonna find these very familiar. The first is beneficial electrification. We have to <clears throat> electrify transportation, heating, and all of our processes in the ind industries and commercial sectors of the economy. But it doesn't do us any good to electrify <clears throat> unless the electricity is generated without carbon. And so the second thing we have to do is decarbonize generation. And <clears throat> as you'll see, <clears throat> what I've done is build out renewable generation in Maine, primarily focused on PV solar, onshore and offshore wind, and using our existing hydro resources <clears throat> and also relying on batteries to match load and generation. And again, that will become clearer as I go on. <clears throat> but in order to do this, we do need battery systems and we need large scale battery storage systems. And these aren't Tesla wall batteries. And these are industrial sized batteries <clears throat> in order to handle Maine's economy. The fourth thing we need <clears throat> and something we don't have now but we're working on it, is we need to convert our electric grid 
from a one-way distributor of electricity to a network where power flows all across the grid in both directions. Now, it won't ever do that simultaneously, but it can do that in a way so that distributed resources can be used to provide energy to us when they're not delivering <clears throat> services to the customers. And we can use load <clears throat> as a substitute in some instances for generation. But we need to have this grid that is a network. Think of it as instead of thinking of the grid as your water system, where the water flows in one direction only to the final tap, <clears throat> which is how our current electric grid operates. We need to think about the electric grid much more like the internet, where communication takes place in a networked environment. <clears throat> and finally, what I'll show you is that this transition and our ability to be successful here requires unprecedented amounts of capital investment for us to make this transition. And because of that, one of the key components to being able to make this transition on an economic basis is to have access to cheap capital. And we'll talk about that near the end of the presentation. So I start <clears throat> with Maine's energy use. Uh, most of this would be familiar to those of you who have studied energy. This is where we get our energy now. Now, what is not included in this are hydro and biomass on the assumption that we will maintain our hydro and we will maintain our biomass resources at current levels for the next 30 years. So th this is really all of the stuff we have to either displace or convert and the electricity is one thing we'd have to convert. <clears throat> it's a lot of energy, but Maine's a big state and there are a lot of people and there's a lot of production that occurs but all of this has to be substituted out into electricity. And we can do that <clears throat> by doing the following. And to give you some perspective, RNS, it's a technical term, but what it really means is current electric load. Now I'm not gonna get into all of the details of what these things mean, but the relative numbers are important. <clears throat> Whatever this unit is, we use 12,000 of them today for electricity in Maine. If we convert all of our heating to electricity, we will get rid of a lot of fuel oil, <clears throat> kerosene and natural gas, but we are gonna use 7,000 more units of electricity. So about 65% of what we're currently using today. <clears throat> all of this, heating that we're gonna use is gonna be heat pumps of one form or another, and they're gonna give us <clears throat> access to air conditioning. And so we will increase our air conditioning loads, but not by a lot. <clears throat> On our process side, and this is all of our industrial processes, if we convert it all to electricity, this is how much electricity we're gonna use. Almost the same amount of electricity that we use today. And then lastly, on our EV charging, <clears throat> passenger vehicles, buses and trucks, total about two thirds of what we use today. So if you think about conversion, <clears throat> this is the amount of electricity we use today. This is the amount of electricity, three and a half times the amount of electricity we will use <clears throat> when we fully convert everything that we're doing today. Now, in my modeling, I'm looking at this over a 30 year period. And what I have assumed is that efficiency, energy conservation act activities, that all of those will occur over these 30 years, <clears throat> but what they will do is offset growth in electricity use. And we're all <clears throat> using more and more electricity, more computers, you know, more televisions, more refrigeration, more everything in society. <clears throat> and so more people, more housing units, all of these things would increase electricity consumption ordinarily, but what I'm assuming is that that's all offset by energy efficiency. So if we wanna do this, 
<clears throat> what we're going to have to do is increase our total electricity consumption by about three times. And our peak load is going to increase by about five times, largely because of heating. Now, graphically, <clears throat> what this new load looks like over the course of the year, and this is from January, this is from January here to December, every hour. The blue down here is our current load. <clears throat> this is what we currently use in Maine. The orange is the amount of electricity we will use for heating. And not surprisingly, that's heavily concentrated in the late fall, winter, and then the winter into spring. Not much in the summer. <clears throat> the green is air conditioning, very little, all of it concentrated in the summer. And the reason why you'll see some here and not here is that I modeled a particular year by hour and it was 20, it was 2017, <clears throat> and these were the hot days during 2017. In 2025, there'll be different days, but there'll be hot days and cool days. The gray is the process load, and this occurs all over the course of the year. It's relatively flat, SAPI, BIW, Pratt & Whitney, they use electricity on a relatively flat basis, or energy. And then lastly, what we'll have is charging load. And charging, again, will be generally flat over the course of the year. Mainers tend to drive a little bit more in the summertime than we do other times of the year. But electric cars get better mileage in the summer than they do in the winter. So those balance off. And we'll charge, you know, whenever we charge our cars, turns out that most studies seem to suggest we'll car charge most of our cars at home overnight. Same is true with school buses. Same is true with postal service trucks and FedEx trucks. So most of our charging will occur overnight. But this is what our load looks like after we do beneficial electrification. So if you think of all the generation that we have in Maine, you know, the Westbrook plant, all the wind turbines, all the hydro stations, the VZ plant, you know, Cousins Island, all of those electric generating plants are currently providing us this blue. What we need to do is build out renewable energy that will cover this entire graph. So it's a very significant undertaking and it's not gonna be done you know, with rooftop solar. I mean, it has to be done with large scale industrial size generating facilities. And again, we'll get to that in a moment. <clears throat> now, what I've assumed is that this doesn't happen overnight. So <clears throat> over this 30 year period from 2020 to 2050, <clears throat> what I've assumed is that here's where we are now with respect to all of this electrification that we're gonna undertake. In each sector, we're gonna get to 100%. So I have forced that on the modeling. Now, whether we ever get there or not <clears throat> is anybody's guess, but I forced us to get to 100% electrification by 2050. And the way I've done it is to say, for instance, for passenger vehicles, this is the red line. So by 2040, you know, roughly 60% of all the cars on the road will be electric. They'll be 100% by 2050. <clears throat> you know, I look at school buses, you look at trucks, <clears throat> you look at heating. You know, we're gonna be installing heat pumps and ground source heat pumps into all of our houses and commercial establishments. That's not gonna happen quite as rapidly as the transition to electric vehicles, but it's gonna happen and it's gonna happen along this curve. So far to efficiency mains credit, <clears throat> we're actually ahead of the pace that I've assumed. They've been doing a really good job putting in heat pumps around the state. And so we're actually running a little bit ahead of this pace but again, I was a little bit conservative in terms of how fast it would occur. The hardest thing to transition is the industrial processes. You know, when you're, when you're looking at big factories <clears throat> and you've got big boilers and you've got big steam systems, converting that to electricity is not easy. In some instances, there's no technology available for doing that today. So what I've done is I've back end loaded that. 
It's convenient. I just don't know how it's going to happen. I know how the electric vehicles are going to shape up. We know what those things look like, and I know what heat pumps look like. But I don't know what this technology is going to look like. So I've said, let's push it off into the future. <clears throat> let's let it happen then. But ultimately, all of this, doing all of this by 2050, is going to get us this electric load shape. And that's what we have to meet. The question is, how do we meet it using renewable generation? I mean, it's easy to meet using nuclear and gas plants and oil plants, but how do we do it with renewables? <clears throat> what the bars in this chart show you is the monthly electricity consumption, January through December, in that graph that you saw before. Instead of looking at it hourly now, I said, what about monthly? Let's look at it monthly. And as you remember from the graph, we use more electricity in the wintertime than we use in the summertime from that graph. But this is what it looks like monthly. This is the monthly load shape that we have to meet. Now, <clears throat> on a percentage basis, so 10% of our energies in January, 10% in March, you know, 7% in May, as little as 6% in September, and so on. The yellow line here shows you the amount of generation from a solar project that occurs each month. Not surprisingly, <clears throat> there's very little solar in the winter months. Most of our solar is generated in the summer months when the sun's out, days are longer. That solar shape doesn't do a very good job matching our load shape. If we wanted to take that yellow line and convert it <clears throat> into these bars, what we would have to do is buy a lot of batteries to take all of this surplus, oh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> to take all of this surplus and have it available to meet this load here and this load here. So solar is a piece of the answer, but it can't be all the answer. <clears throat> the blue line shows you what happens to our existing hydro. Our existing hydro peaks in the spring runoff you know, on all of our major rivers. It's lowest in the late summer and early fall after our summer no rain season. And then it goes up again in the fall when we get more rain, typically. <clears throat> it's okay, it's a little better than solar in these winter periods, but again, hydro is not going to do it either for us. But when we look at wind, both onshore and offshore wind, what we see is almost the mirror image of solar. <clears throat> Most of the wind generation occurs in the wintertime. Very little of it occurs in the summer. And so unlike some parts of the world, California being one of them, <clears throat> we've got a nice convergence or harmony between our generating sources in Maine using offshore and onshore wind to meet our winter season and using solar to meet our summer. So by <clears throat> using combinations of wind and solar, and we'll get to the numbers in a moment, we can come close to meeting this monthly load. Now, hour by hour, it, it'll never match. I mean, it's gonna match on a rare occasion, but it, you can't count on it. So hour by hour, we are gonna need batteries. And so what I've done is I've said, I know what load I have to meet. So I'm gonna put in a lot of solar and I'm gonna put in a lot of wind and we'll get to how much in a moment. <clears throat> and I'm gonna use batteries to match the differential. So whenever I have a little bit too much generation, I'm gonna put it into batteries and I'm gonna take it out whenever I have a little bit too much load. Now this next chart is of some interest, but it's not a, not a particularly important chart, but if you were to power our loads entirely with solar, what would happen is you would run an enormous deficit you'd have to have a huge amount of batteries. And then once we hit March 21st and the days start getting longer, we would now start accumulating 
paying off that deficit. And then we put a lot into storage and we'd be able to ultimately come back to zero. But all of this would have to be batteries. If I use my solar onshore and offshore wind and I overbuild each a little bit, this is what I need. Any deviation from zero is storage. And it's much, much less storage and storage is expensive. So <clears throat> this is possible. Now, what's interesting about this is California has a very different regime. They've got enormous amounts of sunlight. Fortunately, they have it better year round than we have it here. But all of their wind occurs in the summertime. And so what happens in California is they have huge winter deficits against load <clears throat> because their wind doesn't have that acyclical characteristic to it. You remember the Santa Ana winds, all the far, you know, the fires that they have, they're all summertime fires. When I say summer, it's April to October <clears throat> because the wind comes off the desert. Here, we've got this prevailing westerly that's of enormous helpful, helpfulness to us, Northwest winds in the winter time that really do, a, do us a lot of good. So <clears throat> what I've said is let's build out a system over the next 30 years and let's let that system be about 7,500 megawatts of salt. Put that in perspective, we've got about maybe 100 megawatts built today in May. And all of this net metering projects that we're doing are gonna get us maybe 1,000 megawatts, but we'll need seven times that much in order to meet our load obligations. Let's do 2,500 megawatts of wind. Right now we've got almost 1,000 megawatts of wind, but there's no other good places to put wind anymore because people don't wanna put it on our ridge tops, which is where all our wind is in Southern Maine. So the only place we can really put this is up in Aroostook in the potato and broccoli fields. <clears throat> the wind conditions aren't as good as they are on, the, on our, you know, our ridge tops, like on the top of Sugarloaf or on the top of Katahdin or on the top of other, other good mountains, but <clears throat> it's still good enough to be able to be financially viable. But the key to our future and being able to meet our load obligations is 5,000 megawatts of offshore wind. So we can do 10 times this amount of solar without any problem at all in May. <clears throat> to put this in perspective, this amount of solar will take about 40,000 acres of land. Maine has 17 million acres of land, not counting all of our lakes and rivers. This is just land area. So we need to do this, <clears throat> we would need about 40,000 acres. Right? Now, 17 million acres is a lot of land, but obviously some of it's developed. About a million acres is developed, so that's 16 million. About half of the land is on the north side of mountains, not the south side. Right? We don't want to put solar on the north side or in the valleys on the north side. So that drops us down to 8 million acres. But 40,000 acres on 8 million is a trivial amount of land. So the solar is not a problem. The onshore wind, we can put this up in a rustic and it can work. But it's the offshore wind that's critical. If we don't do this, we don't have a prayer given current technologies to get to zero carbon by 2050. Now, the way I've done it <clears throat> in the modeling is I have assumed that we're gonna front end solar. Solar's cheaper. We can do it earlier on in the process. So we're gonna put a fair amount of solar in while we wait for the offshore wind to fall in price. As it falls in price as a result of our experiments, you know, our, our <clears throat> pilot projects that we're doing, here, but also in Europe and ultimately Japan, Korea, and the West Coast, the cost curve is going to start falling. And that's when we're going to really ramp up our offshore wind, 2040 <clears throat> to the end of you know, to 2050. That's when most of these 5,000 megawatts are going to go in. Right. 
I'm going to skip this chart because it just tells you what I've assumed about the capital costs associated with each of the technologies. I'm happy to go over it later, but it's a, it's a little bit in the weeds. The only thing that really matters, and I'm going to come back to this point, is I have assumed that we can finance all of this capital investment with 3% money. Now, for those of you who heard me talk about our main generation authority, or have heard me talk about pine tree power, <clears throat> you can begin to see why those are so important as low cost sources of capital. But again, I'll come back to this issue in a bit. So now what I wanna do is, you know, we've seen a little bit about what the load has to look like. <clears throat> we've seen a little bit about what the generation has to look like. Now, what happens to cost? <clears throat> you know, here is what we have spent over the last 20, 15 years or so from 2000 to 2016. I haven't updated the data, um, but 2017 and 2018, this would be relatively flat <clears throat> in real terms, so adjusted for inflation. And we spend roughly 5 billion to 6 billion to $7 billion, five to $7 billion a year on energy in Maine, all forms of energy. <clears throat> our GDP in Maine, our gross domestic product or gross state product in Maine is about $60 billion. So 10 cents out of every dollar of our income goes to pay for energy. Now, if we can do this transition and keep within that 10% range, this is affordable. But if we try to do this transition and all of a sudden we have to spend 20% of our income on energy, it just won't happen. We won't be able to afford it. We don't have that amount of discretionary income in Maine to be able to accommodate that kind of an increase in what we have to spend on energy. <clears throat> so looking at the transition that I just described to you, these bars here are every year the amount of money we will spend on energy as we do this transition. And we can stay within the range. This is the low end of the range over the last 20 years. This is the high end of the range. And this is the average of about $6 billion. We can do this, but we have to do it smart. One of the things that's happening over this period, these bars here are the same as the green ones. They're the same, I've just color coded them differently, but it's the same bars. <clears throat> what, what's gonna happen during this period is that we are gonna move away from fossil fuel. So our fossil fuel costs are the gray portion of each of these bars. They're gonna fall down to zero. And what we're gonna do is displace it with increased investments in our grid, our electric grid. Remember the grid has to get much bigger to handle all this new electricity. So we're gonna increase the amount of, of grid that we have and we have to spend money on that. We are gonna reduce the amount of electricity that we use or that we're buying from fossil fuels today down to zero. And we're gonna displace that <clears throat> with all of this generation that I just described to you, financed at 3% money. And then ultimately to match generation and load, what we're gonna to have to do is put in storage. And this is what those storage costs look like. So you can see, I mean, the story of the transition is one in which our energy spend goes from fuel, sort of pay as you go, pay as you use, pay as you generate electricity to capital expenses, buying transmission lines and poles, buying solar projects, buying wind projects, buying battery storage. Right? Are we transition from fuel to capital, operating cost to fixed costs. Now the amount of this investment is substantial. What I've laid out to you <clears throat> every year, this is how much money we will spend. And this is where we will be spending it. 
based on that on the modeling. Over this period, we will spend, and this is the cumulative amount, or I say spend, but it's really investing because we're investing in the grid and investing in generation, but we're gonna to have to put this capital to work. We're gonna spend almost $60 billion. Roughly ballpark $2 billion a year. Not so much initially, but as we get into the offshore wind and the battery storage, a lot later on. <clears throat> and we can, and, and, but you know, having spent all this money, the carrying costs, the amount that we have to pay off every year in interest and debt service and principal on all of the spending, that's what shows up in these bars here. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna spend sixty billion dollars, and we're gonna pay about six billion dollars a year in interest and principal costs, and a little bit of operating and maintenance costs. And that six billion is roughly what we're spending today for all of our energy that we're consuming: the gasoline that goes in our cars, the heating oil that goes into our houses, the natural gas that goes into our factories. All of that. Six billion dollars we're displacing. Now the consequence of this <clears throat> is that ultimately we move from a lot of carbon emissions to zero. But the path that I've just laid out is not a it's not an overnight path. I mean it takes a lot of investment. You can see you know we're we're, we're spending a billion dollars a year here in or investing you know in in these technologies. It's a billion dollars. I mean, this is more money by far than we ever spend in our schools or in our public housing or any things that we engage in. I mean, it's a lot of money. And this doesn't count all the heat pump money that each of individuals are gonna spend or the electric vehicles each of us are gonna buy. This is only for the grid and the energy. And we're gonna be putting a lot of money into that. <clears throat> and, but it's gonna take some time to have an effect but ultimately it will, and it'll be accumulating effect. And so while we may not see much in the way of emission reductions early on, once we exceed certain threshold levels, it'll start happening very, very rapidly and we can get to zero, but it's not an easy path. I mean, if somebody were to ask me today, are we gonna get there? I mean, you, know, you gotta be pessimistic. I mean, it's, it's tough to get this kind of a conversion of an economy to occur. Now, we're working at it, means moving things along. We're trying to get more people with electric cars. You know, we're trying to get more heat pumps out into the system. We're trying to build more solar. We're wrestling with offshore wind. You know, we're fighting people all along the way, whether it's lobstermen or oil dealers or you know, whatever it is, I mean, we're fighting people all along the way to do this transition. It's a hard transition to accomplish. And what makes it especially hard, I mean, you think about all the other transitions we've gone through. <clears throat> you know, think of the automobile. All of the investments that went into our roads and our cars, what we got at the end of that period, each of us individually, we got an automobile and we got to get rid of the horse. And so it was a tremendous benefit to us individually. Right? When we went to electricity, you know, from coal and kerosene and whale oil lamps and whatever else we burned, we all benefited enormously by that transition personally. I mean, it was good for our houses. It was good for each of us. This transition is different. And I put on solar on my rooftop. I generate pretty much all my electricity now through net metering. I put heat pumps in, got, you know, I generate virtually all of my heat instead of using propane with heat pumps. But at the end of the day, I'm getting the same amount of heat that I used to get from the propane. It's no better. It's no different for me inside. It feels just the same. And I'm using the same amount of electricity that I used to use off the grid I'm getting it now from my solar panels, but it's the same electricity. The lights aren't different. The stove doesn't work differently. The computer doesn't work differently. It's all the same. 
The big difference between this transition and all of our past transitions is in our past transitions, they provided direct immediate benefits to the individuals and the companies in society. This transition provides a long-term social benefit in the form of carbon reductions and a solution to global warming and global catastrophe. <clears throat> Getting that kind of collective action, you know, is really hard. And that's what makes this transition so difficult. If we were doing something here at the end that gave us something different than what we already have, it would be an easier transition. What, we, what we're going to get is we're going to get clean air. We're going to get better climate. But that's not something that we can spend and consume immediately. You know, that's, <clears throat> your Tesla works just like every other car. You don't see that immediate benefit. It's deferred gratification. So with that, <clears throat> Matt, I'll conclude. <clears throat> and, um, you have, you can have, Joan has a copy of this. Matt has a copy. They can send it around to you. If you go to this website, you can download electronically the copy of the book. If you email me at this address or email Matt, um, I'd be happy to email you, put a hard copy uh, in the mail to you. So with that, I'll stop sharing the screen and be happy to answer or talk to about any questions that you guys, well, I'll leave the screen up in case you have questions about any of the individual graphs, but I'm happy to answer any questions or to hear your own thoughts about the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that was, that was really helpful. And we have some questions in the chat and feel free to pick some out as well, Rich, but I guess just starting um and i did just put that link to the actual book in the chat um i you guess don't starting... seem to be able to find my chat matt so you may have to do this oh, for no me. no problem um yeah becky asked about modeling for increased temperatures in the in the future um we might have higher cooling loads uh yes. in the wind yeah in the future did you no, I didn't. That's way, way, I mean, that's way too complicated. Uh, introducing dynamism into this model is, I mean, it can be done and, and it wasn't the ultimate purpose of this. I mean, if I wanted to, you know, get this published by the American Academy of National Academy of Sciences, I, you know, I would have had to have done that kind of work, but I really didn't want to get into it in that much detail. But Becky, you are right. There are feedback effects in here. Uh, and unfortunately, for most of the feedback effects, we're on the wrong end of it. And some of, some of the feedback effects are actually beneficial. For example, as we switch to winter peaking electricity use, that actually is a benefit because our grid can carry more power when it's colder outside because it, it doesn't heat up as much and resistance is lower. But for things like air conditioning and, uh, you know, and, and summertime activities, uh, it's a problem and the feedback effect is the wrong direction. Great, thank you. Um, and I did get a couple individual questions and there's one in the chat about um, rooftop solar and kind of distributed energy. I know earlier um, you mentioned that that would be a real challenge. Can you talk more about uh, maybe why rooftop solar couldn't work or why more smaller projects would not work? <clears throat> they can work. I mean, my rooftop solar is as good as, uh, you know, like a, a field of you know, 100 acres of solar. It's gonna provide the same electricity. And to some extent, it's actually a little better because it's closer to load. So it's marginally better, not a lot better, but marginally better um, than the big size solar. The problem is that my rooftop solar, I mean, I'm gonna measure this now in kilowatts as opposed to megawatts. So we would need 7,500,000 kilowatts. My system is eight. And the average rooftop is eight, nine, 10. Now we can do a lot of rooftops and we'll get 
a dent in this, we might actually get a third of this potentially as being rooftop solar. But we're not going to get to the full 7,500 megawatts using rooftop solar. The other thing too is that rooftop solar works really well for warehouses where the rooftop relative to the electric use in the building is large. <clears throat> rooftop solar works miserably for large scale commercial office buildings. Right, go, if you're in Portland, take a look at the roof of any of one city center and compare the available roof that you have up there to the amount of electricity consumed in that building. And it doesn't work well. So what that means is for our major cities, you've got to import all of this electricity from places where you can generate it economically. And those places are places like Hiram and Parsons Field and play Oxford, places where there's land. And so you've got to bring that all into the city. You know, when you drive down 95 through New England, <clears throat> which you see, you see a little less of it today, but in Hartford and Bridgeport and Stamford and Providence, you used to see these big coal oil plants sitting right in the middle of the harbor. And the reason for that was because they were next to low. And so you economized on transmission by putting your generation next to load. That works real well for high dense fuels like oil and coal and even natural gas. <clears throat> it doesn't work well for low dense fuels like solar. So one of the issues with this transition that we have to uh, think about <clears throat> is how we are gonna move all of this generation. Let me back up a second here, I'm sorry, oh, wrong way all of this generation from these facilities into our load centers. Now we got it pretty easy in, in Maine. Portland's small and it's pretty rural once you get a little bit out. But can you imagine New York City? And that, you know, just think of it, even if you put solar on all of the rooftops in New York City, you'd meet maybe 1% of their total load. And so you gotta bring all that power from places offshore, <clears throat> as well as solar, into New York. Um, it becomes a real challenge. All right, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. <clears throat> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mix, um, just because they're related, there's a couple questions on cost. Um, one seems to be more on social costs from David and a few others. Um, I think it gets at what 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 happens if we um, or what are the costs if we don't <laughs> don't decarbonize the grid, and um, relatedly, <coughs> how how can we actually um, show people they have a personal benefit to doing this? Well, I, I mean, the cost if we don't decarbonize. First off, if Maine doesn't do anything, there is no change, right? I mean, we are so trivial in the broad atmosphere, but you have to do it. I mean, you, you know, we're all in this together. You've got to pull your weight. And, you know, this is, if the left guard on one play at the Patriots doesn't block, well, maybe it's a quick release and there's no harm done. But, you know, you can't, you can't get, you can't win Super Bowls doing that. Everybody's got to pull their weight. So, and, but in the cost for not doing it, I think, you know, the, the, the UN, Paris Accords, I mean, all of that demonstrate that there's enormous costs of doing it. Uh, now, <clears throat> those costs, people don't quite understand them and they aren't internalizing them very well. You know, I mean, what really are the costs to somebody who lives at a thousand feet above sea level, you know, in Skowhegan? You know, maybe there's no direct cost other than, you know, it may rain a little bit more on, when it rains, it may rain heavier. Uh, but it's it maybe a little warmer in the winter. There may be a few more ticks, right? But, but I can tell you, I, I'm, I live at Pine Point. <clears throat> My house sits at 16 feet above sea level. I mean, low tide, not high tide, 16 feet above low tide. And I can tell you that if we don't do something, the cost to me is going to be my house probably within 40 years. And commercial street, you know, I mean, all of these places. I think people at some level understand those costs bringing them and making them real is really hard. 
you, you guys, Sierra Club, you know, organizations like yourself, I mean, you're the ones that really have to do this. Um, they try to bring it home to people, make them understand that these are costs. And the reality is, is they aren't costs or they probably won't be significant costs for many of us. I mean, I'm 70 and I'm gonna die before there's any catastrophic climate change problems. But my kids and my grandchildren aren't. And, and so you gotta pay attention to them. I mean, I thought just as an example, the most recent, you probably have seen this, but you know, so the equivalent of a Supreme Court decision in Germany threw out their carbon plan because they had a two back end loaded and they, they were imposing too high a percent of the cost of conversion on people that were gonna be around in 2035, 2040 and 2045 and not enough on people who are around today. I mean, I thought that was incredibly foresightful. And, you know, those are the things that the younger generation are going to have to keep hitting home and hitting home hard. Uh, and, you know, you guys, despite the evidence on the screen that we're looking at, you guys, Sierra Club tends to have a lot of young members. And so you got to get them out and get them mobilized. Uh, you know, we're not going to do a good job pricing the social consequences of not doing this action. I mean, we've tried, I'm an economist, you know, I, I, <clears throat> carbon taxes runs in my blood, right? I, I mean, I would like nothing more than to have carbon taxes. It would solve a lot of the problems that we're running into with the design of policy, but it's just not gonna happen. We gotta figure out a way to do it without that. And we're working our way through it. I mean, we're getting better at it, um, but ultimately this is, if we can solve this question, we have solved the proverbial $64,000, a million dollar, a billion dollar, trillion dollar question that we have to face. Well, we're certainly trying to mobilize as many people as possible to uh, move on this. And I will try to find, or maybe you have it, that article about Germany in the email follow-up to folks. Um, so there's another question about costs, and then a lot of people have questions about battery storage. So we'll We'll definitely touch on that. But uh, Dan asked, what do annual costs look like after the 30 year period of capital investment is completed? How much will it cost to maintain this generation and transmission infrastructure after the transitional investment is completed? <clears throat> That's a good question. And, and you know, because of the, the way in which I've presented the analysis and, and written the book, I focused only up to 2050. If in the modeling that I did, I carried it forward an additional 10 years just to make sure that I wasn't doing something wrong. And, and what I mean by wrong, I don't mean wrong mathematically, I mean wrong logically. And, and that we were gonna see this number continue to rise and rise and rise and rise and rise. And that wouldn't solve anybody's problem. What actually happens is that by 2050, we hit a sort of steady state where the earlier investments are now fully depreciated and they're getting replaced by the next generation of solar, the next generation of wind and so on. And what happens is, is this curve actually flattens out at around 6 billion in real terms. Um, I just, I mentioned this in the book, I don't describe it in the graphs, um, but <clears throat> we don't run into, we don't have a problem going forward. We reach a steady state around 2050. But it's an excellent question, very perceptive, and, um, and, and uh, you know, there's no good way to cover every piece of material in, in a short period of time. Um, but it is something that I worried about, and, and you'll see it in the book where I do talk about that issue. Okay. Um, there are several battery storage questions, so I think I'll do my best just to pick a few out and we can maybe talk about it in general, but um, I guess I guess Phil's question is probably the most critical is, can we really build that many batteries economically um, is, is the first question. And yeah, what are the other technologies out there? I mean, is, I know you assumed that the technology would be developed, but how do you see battery storage technology right now? Well, right now, I mean, we're doing really well on batteries. Um, you know, I mean, there are there are 
issues associated with you know certain minerals that have to go into the batteries, um, and some of them you know periodically go into short supply, some of them not. There are, of course, issues associated with the environmental mining of things and human rights issues and, and social equity issues and all of those kinds of things. But from a technological perspective, we'll work through that. I mean, you know, where we are in the, in, when you think about batteries, you know, not the, the lead acid ones that we've got, but the newer technology batteries that we're working with, I mean, these are, infant batteries in their life cycle stages. I mean, we are really early on in this process. And we will figure out ways in which we can store batteries using different materials, different technology, or store electricity rather, using different materials um, more efficiently and at lower costs over time. <clears throat> what I've done in my modeling is I have focused only on the lithium ion batteries that we're using today for you know the Tesla put out down in Australia that we have up at CMP's facility in Cousins Island, those kinds of batteries. Right now that storage is costing us about $500 a kilowatt hour. This was actually in 2019. The numbers are now down closer to 350 a kilowatt hour. By 2050 in real terms, <clears throat> I'm assuming in the modeling that they're gonna cost $41. Now that cost curve is consistent with anything that you look at in the literature, whether it's NREL or Bloomberg's modeling, this is the cost curve that they see, lithium ion falling along. Now what is not included are the next level of technologies, for instance, solid state lithium or air lithium. Now there are problems with those that we haven't been able to overcome. Air lithium is far, far more dense and far cheaper. The problem is it's explosive, it ignites. Well, maybe we'll figure out a way to solve that problem. And then there are other kinds of technologies that are in the wings you know, to figure out how to do that. If you would have, I mean, some of you weren't around in 1990 or at least not around enough to even be, answer, be able to answer the question, but if you were to ask somebody in 1990 what it would cost to put solar on somebody's rooftop, they would have told you it would cost you about one year's worth of your income. <clears throat> now, that's only 30 years ago. Today, you know, it's a very small amount of money by comparison to put solar. I mean, in 30 years, we have reduced the amount of, of, of you know, costs for these technologies so much that they are now getting close to being free on a dollars or cents per kilowatt hour basis for the generation itself. I mean, we see prices now in Texas, California on a 30 year levelized basis just for the generation at about two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. We see those same prices for some of our customers in India at just over one cent a kilowatt hour. And we are seeing them now beginning to approach a penny a kilowatt hour in Saudi Arabia and other places where the sun is extremely beneficial for solar. And so battery storage is gonna move down that same curve. I can't tell you how it's gonna do it. I can't tell you when it's gonna do it, but it's going to happen. I mean, too many smart people are working on this stuff today relative to the number of people that worked on it a generation ago. Yeah, and we'll we'll try to provide maybe another resource or two of because there's a lot of questions about potential technologies. Um, yes. Maybe there's a way to just add one or two of those to the email afterwards. But specifically, just real quick on the... Um, Isla Ho project. Uh, yep. Are you familiar with the uh, capacitors out there, and do you do you think those are a potential? <clears throat> they are for certain kinds of of storage arrangements. Um, capacitors are very good at instantaneously delivering electricity and large amounts of it. Um, they are less effective as a storage 
technology from multi-day periods. But that doesn't mean you, you, know, you can't use them in the grid. You can. And you know, the Isle of Ho project describes one way in which they can be used as a way of balancing loads. Um, and you know, capacitors, I mean, we have a lot of capacitors on the grid now. CMP has deployed quite a few of them to balance loads almost instantaneously. Um, there's, you know, there are stations that they have around the state and all utilities do this. Isla Ho is doing it in the context of you know, trying to create a microgrid and balancing loads that are tied to small change. They're small changes, but relative to the system, they're quite large. And capacitors are very good at that kind of balancing. All right, thank you. Um, all right, I know, I think we're, <laughs> we're gonna have to have you back for a part two in the uh, fall, but I know we're coming up on the end here. So maybe the last question um, for right now is from, I think Philip's question is a good one to end on. Can other states do this? Is net zero sufficient or will we need to reach net negative in a regional national context? Well, on the, la on the latter, I mean, net zero probably won't do it because Zimbabwe is never going to get to zero, right? So, you know, somebody's going to have to offset something about what other people are doing. But I think from, you know, from a policy perspective, it's hard enough to get to zero, let alone negative. And so, you know, if, if we overshoot a bit, more is the benefit, right? So, and I didn't worry too much about that question, although the IPCC stuff does suggest that if we really want to stop temperature climbing too high, we got to start taking carbon out of the air. I didn't address that issue. Now, the, <clears throat> the other question, what was the first part of it, Matt? I, I just lost it. Uh, I think it was just, can other states? Yes, do thank you. Um, yes, they can. And, and some states have an easier time doing it, and some states will have a harder time doing it. You, you saw in the, in the modeling that offshore wind was essential for Maine in order to meet this. And it will be for most of the East Coast states. And the reason is, is because we have no onshore wind. Now, there's no offshore in Iowa but we don't need offshore wind in Iowa because we have plenty of onshore wind. So Iowa has, <clears throat> just like we have a nice balance between solar and wind, Iowa, for example, has a very nice balance between solar and its onshore wind. So, and in fact, there are many days today when Iowa is actually generating with 100% wind power all of the energy that it's using in the state. Uh, Texas similarly has a much easier time doing it. <clears throat> there are places where it's gonna be a little trickier and you know, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to get there quite so easily. Uh, California is one of them. Their winter load is gonna to be tough to meet, um, but they've got a lot of good hydro out there that they can operate differently. Right now, a lot of their hydro is run to meet summer loads because that's when they're peaking. Um, but as we put in more wind and more solar, some of that hydro can be shifted to meet winter loads. And so there may be some opportunities in places like California to move things around. But I think in, in the US, the more, most difficult areas I believe are gonna be <clears throat> places like South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, places where there's not a lot of good wind regime and there's a lot of sun, but there may not be enough to cover the winter loads. All right. Well, thank you. So on, on, that, on that one more thing yeah, on that. Go for it. <clears throat> what we're seeing as well, and this is maybe another technology that and you may want to talk about this in another session um, that you could have with somebody, but in Europe, they've got some of the same problems we have here, right? With wind, they got a lot of wind year round, a lot of load in the winter time, not a lot of sun in the winter in the winter time. And what they're looking at doing is converting a lot of that summertime wind that they've got 
<clears throat> into hydrogen and using the hydrogen as a fuel to heat homes rather than electricity. So hydrogen's a wild card in this. I didn't deal with it um, because I, I focused on batteries as the storage medium, but hydrogen <clears throat> has some potential as well. And uh, you know we're seeing a lot of interest being played, especially in, in Northern Europe around hydrogen. So that's, I did, I did want to mention that as another option. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you for that. And yeah, we'll try to combine or compile some of the resources we talked about in a follow-up email. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you all very much for coming. Um,